Hello and welcome to The Launchpad. This is an offshoot of the Startup a Storefront podcast where we talk to the founders of companies that are just getting started and whose stories we find compelling. Today we talk with Ralph and Caroline Wald, co-founders and the husband and wife chef duo behind Aymara Peruvian Kitchen. The restaurant industry is constantly evolving and trends can seemingly pop up and disappear overnight. But one industry trend that is looking like it has some staying power is the ghost kitchen. Brick and mortar restaurants begat more cost efficient food trucks, which have in turn led to even more cost efficient ghost kitchens. Today we cover how the coronavirus pandemic steered Ralph and Caroline into opening Aymara, the economics of taking orders through delivery apps, and how to progress from a cook to a chef. Hang on, hang on. If you're not subscribed, can you go ahead and do that right now before we get on with the video? Helps us out tremendously. That's all we ask. And we're back. Now, on to the episode. All right, bienvenidos al podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Aymara Peruvian Kitchen with Caroline and Ralph. Thank you guys for joining. Tell us a little bit about your uh, what you guys are working on here in Lincoln Heights. Hi, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, so I'm Caroline, and uh, this is my husband, Ralph. Uh, we are Aymara Peruvian Kitchen. And we're a family business. This is us. This is, you know, my husband and I. And we opened back in October 2020. So right in the middle of that crazy year. And we do Peruvian food with authentic Peruvian ingredient that we source here in LA. And then we import from Peru. We are a ghost kitchen operation. So we offer, you know... Uh, fast and fresh food with delivery, curbside pickup. Uh, we also do catering. And our goal is really to, you know, deliver authentic Peruvian food in this crazy world of 2020 and 2021. <laughs> it is a crazy world. When you guys were going down the path of, of dis and we'll get all into all the delicious food after, but when you guys were going down the path, I know this is kind of a new thing for a lot of people in the restaurant industry where you have so many options. You can go with a food truck, which is kind of a lightweight, less expensive version. You can go full blown restaurant, which is super expensive and you have to hit, you have to like do really well for five, six years in order to get any sort of money back, especially if you're building out this brand new kitchen. And so as you guys were thinking about your options and it's COVID, so we throw another issue where no one can come in anyway, for the most part, right? And so what landed you on the decision to to pursue a ghost kitchen or, or how did you even learn about the cloud kitchen ghost kitchen concept? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. We had been looking to open a restaurant for years. We were back in March, 2020, we were actively looking for a location. In fact, two days before the shutdown, we were having a meeting with a landlord about a space that we loved and we were having lunch and we didn't. We, it didn't happen, obviously, because two days later, you know, the whole world was shutting, <laughs> was shutting down. So it always been our dream to open a Peruvian restaurant. Now, after, you know, COVID-19, obviously, we had to rethink about everything. What's going to happen? We've seen all the restaurant closure, you know, around the country, around the world. So we were like, okay, what's next? You know, and you know, Ralph lost both of his job. I personally did not have any clients with my consulting business. So we were like, okay, what, <laughs> what are we going to do? And back in May, you know, I literally called the health department, you know, of Los Angeles. I started to ask questions and they actually the one that told me about Ghost Kitchen. And then I started investigating and I was like, oh, that's you know, sounds really good. It's it's going to be the right fit for us. And they actually, Ghost Kitchen, you know, were already successful before the pandemic, right? But then obviously with, you know, what happened last year, it took that business model to a, a whole new level. Yeah. Well, first of all, congratulations on losing your jobs. I know that sounds crazy, but the thing I, I tell everyone, like get fired or lose your job because you're finally going to do something that you love. And you know, while it feels very depressing, I think at the end of the day, it's a net positive and you're still here, you're thriving. Um, you guys are working together. And so I'm, I'm, things are moving in the right direction, which is exciting. As you guys 
got the ghost kitchen, right? Like there's so many unknowns. So if, if I'm, if people are watching, listening, and they're thinking of starting their own ghost kitchen just because of COVID or because it makes way more sense financially, what's the hard part? Like at the end of the day, you have to do all this marketing, right? Cause no one can come to you. And so how does that work for you guys? Is there any training? Is there like groups out there that can help? Or is it just you guys doing social media and just plugging away little by little by little? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is, a, this is the most difficult part for everything because even we open almost over over three months already. Five. Yeah, four months. Yeah. So now it's, <laughs> it's going to be four months already and people are still calling. Hey, um, do you have a patio? Can I get a reservation okay. for you? So it's difficult because we're inside of a building. So we have to explain to people, hey, where I go to kitchen, you know, uh, you can order online or you can call us and we can bring the food outside. No, but I want to talk with somebody. Yeah, I'm, I'm I want to see the person. menu. They're like, I want to see the menu. I want to see what you have. Right. And we're like, yeah, no, that we have pictures online, you know. <laughs> and, and then a lot of people believe or think it's like, so your pictures are real, you know, because you're a ghost. So I want, <laughs> I, I, I would expect. The, the people that are, are looking, you know, so I want to make sure that your pictures are the real from when, when I get, yes, of course, you know, yeah, but you're a ghost kitchen, I cannot see you. Yeah, the most difficult part is, you know, explaining to to potential customer how they can, you know, order from us and, and, and reach out, right? But overall, and I think, you know, the pandemic and all the closure actually helps people because they know there's some, they know they cannot come in anyway, so it kind of helped our model but yeah and then for you know spreading the word i mean we do social media yeah i mean it's really is about social media we were you know we had invited you know influencers from instagram we're doing you know a podcast with you the first time (laughs) for the first time so we're trying you know different marketing you know different type of you know how to reach out to people and then we also do the the traditional, we have flyers and we literally go to the neighborhoods, you know, the, the business neighbors in Lincoln Heights and we, you know, introduce ourselves. We do some specials for the neighbors. So I also wanted to talk to you guys because we're building a brewery in Lincoln Heights. And so as we think about our grand opening, it's always good to partner with different people within the community. And so we can talk about that later, but that's something that's on the horizon. When you guys get your orders in, is it mostly like Uber Eats, DoorDash app orders, or is it mostly people like me who order and then come up and then pick it up? What do you, what are you seeing the behavior and how has that changed maybe through COVID? I would say at the beginning it was only because nobody knows us, you know? So our right, brand right. was brand new, it was a baby. And we come from different backgrounds. I'm not a chef. I never, she never worked as a chef. So. You know, so we just pop out in Lincoln Heights and introduce ourselves, you know, to every single neighbor. Hey, you know, I'm from Aymara. We cook for you. You know, we can cook. Yeah, nobody knew no, us. Nobody knew as, us. You know, and, but um, I think that the platforms, I call it the platform, like all the deliveries sure. up, it's now it's about 20% of, you know, okay. our revenue. And the lower it is, the better. <laughs> yeah, the fees are too high. The fees are not favorable. Yes. Yeah. And yes. actually, you yes. know, a lot of people seeing that ordering for platforms, they think that we're not paying commissions, you know? Yeah, there is, as the customer don't know, you know, that. Tell us, tell, tell everyone, tell everyone the realities of this, because I've been saying this forever. I'm like, restaurants are not making money on this, on these, on some of these dishes and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I would say 95 percent of platforms they charge us 25 to 33 percent of all the sales from you, the net sales or net sales mm-hmm. so let's say you buy something for ten dollars you're paying the platform three dollars and thirty cents right yeah and that, that's an, and the customer is already paying a delivery fee and sometimes right. i think it's another fee something another fee so for sure you have to have them i believe i mean because we're still new so we want to you know I don't think it's completely bad to have them, but for sure, the more the customer reach out directly to us, the better. And, you know, we, we, we have their name, we write, we do personal thank you cards that we write every night. And uh, so when the customer reach out to us, it's, it's, it's very personal. 
we have a lot of repeated customer already, so. I know some cities, I know here in West Hollywood, basically the WeHo, the West Hollywood Chamber of Commerce is, is effectively having all of the, these delivery delivery apps and they're passing legislation like rules that restrict the amount of fees that each of these delivery apps or pickup apps or just order apps can can charge the restaurant. And what's nice that I've seen here in West Hollywood is some of the restaurants are getting together and not allowing any delivery apps on like, an, like basically imagine 30 restaurants saying we're not going to be on any apps. And so what happens is people like me, we're looking for it. We don't see it. Then we go to their Instagram and they're all like, yeah, we're not on the apps. Please come support us. And here's why. And they're telling everybody like the dollar amounts. And uh, I just think that education is super important because it's, it's hard to survive as a business already. In your space, are there other restaurants too? Or are you guys the only one? Uh, yes, there is a few other retailers in our building. It's mostly wholesales and yeah, more wholesales. Uh, but there is another few. Yeah, but it's not the majority. Mm-hmm. Just from a cost perspective. So I think about it like this, like to build out a kitchen could cost somewhere between 500,000, 600,000, especially if you're buying all new equipment, leasing a kitchen space, uh, still kind of expensive. And so was the cloud kitchen model significantly more or less expensive for you guys? No, for sure. Building, building a restaurant from scratch can cost anywhere from a quarter million to millions of dollars. And yeah. with permitting with the city and health department plan check, it can take months up to years sometimes. I've seen this before in LA. So ghost kitchen really is not only it's less investment, significantly less investment, but it's also a faster process. If you get all your paperwork together, you can open within two weeks. Three weeks. Yeah, two, three weeks. You know, you oh, just wow. have to bring your equipment in you know, and that's it. Right. Everything else is permitted yeah. already. So it really makes sense, especially for new concepts like us, when you want to test the market. For me, ghost kitchens are what food truck used to be like 10, 15 years ago. You know, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep on growing because of COVID, obviously, but also because it's, it's, it's so much easier for young chef or startup, you know, concepts. And you can see Ghost Kitchen opening all across the country, you know, in Houston, in Chicago. Yeah. So do you see this as a stepping stone for something bigger in the future? Do you plan on opening up an actual restaurant a couple of years down the line or whenever whenever you you guys feel like you're ready to make the jump? Yeah. So we were thinking to to have a, a restaurant, but now because all the pandemics, we need a big patio <laughs> just to make sure, yeah. you know, just to make sure we can run. This is our goal, you know. Uh, we were actually about to, you know, open a, a full restaurant with bar, with patio and everything, you know, and put all authentic Peruvian experience you know, that I see that I didn't see so many Peruvians that are really authentic in, in Los Angeles in my perspective. But we do something young, you know. Yeah, we, we, we definitely looking in open a when I don't know <laughs> because I mean with everything that is still going on I don't know how the the restaurant industry is, is going to be even in six months uh, but at some point yes we would love to you know open a brick and mortar location and like you said like give the full Peruvian experience with music and, and cocktails you know, you talk about this full Peruvian experience, and one of the things that I know about the restaurant world is that certain cuisines are looked upon more favorably than others. So, for example, you look at which restaurants have Michelin stars handed out to them. A lot of them are either French or Italian, some Spanish, and not a lot else in terms of other countries' cultures and cuisines. So, Caroline, I know you you are from France, what was that decision like? Did you even consider opening up a French restaurant versus a Peruvian? I mean, I agree with you, Ralph. I think that there are not enough authentic Peruvian restaurants out there in the world, let alone L.A. So I, I applaud you guys for going the Peruvian route. But what do you guys think about that whole culture of exclusivity in terms of cuisine in, in higher end restaurants? Yeah, no, for, for sure. I feel like French and Japanese are like... if. She, 
the you know on the top of like the Michelin criteria I, I, I don't know I've, it's funny you say that because I always say it's always these are French or Japanese and then sometimes there is a little bit of Spain or I don't Italian. know Italian Italian but uh, Peruvian Peruvian food in general is actually very for the past I believe what Eight five years. seven so, yeah seven years Peruvian food is really booming there is a lot of great chefs. In San Francisco, in Peru, actually, there is three resta- three Peruvian restaurants on the top 10. And they have Michelin star. And they have Michelin star. So it, it's actually, Peruvian is becoming fancy, actually. <laughs> but no, I think for us, it makes sense to open Peruvian, uh, a Peruvian restaurant rather than a French restaurant because we love family, comfort food. Peruvian food is more about that, like amazing flavor sharing the meal with your family and ob- obviously you know french french food is amazing i mean that's that's my roots right but i don't know i feel like in la spe- specifically for la peruvian is more approachable and also it's a little more mixed so if you go to i mean you can to a any time you're welcome to come please <laughs> yeah so you can get a ceviche is a uh, peruvian japanese you get a uh, fried rice uh, peruvian chinese you get a uh, uh, pesto pasta, Italian Peruvian. You know, there is a mix of every single country. So you have a lot of variety that you can get Italian, Chinese, uh, Japanese. Yeah, you can never get bored with Peruvian food. It's, there's so many different dishes. I agree. Hey, show, show us the can you're drinking. I just want everyone to see this beautiful icon of culture right here, that little Inca Cola. La bebida del Peru. <laughs> <laughs> lo mejor, lo mejor del Peru. I grew up with this. So Nick, I, I would play soccer in Peru and then I would drink Inca. I'd run home and drink Inca Cola. I don't it's not very healthy, but that's what it's I did. Probably not recommended by dietitians, but yeah. Not anymore. At one time it was. And so from you guys, as you, I'm just thinking about this as like a growth model, right? So it seems like, and in talking to you, I'm kind of learning this. It seems like if you start a ghost kitchen, it's kind of a lightweight way, lightweight in the sense of not building your own restaurant. It's, you know, light cost way of building a brand while testing the market, let's say, right? And so then it kind of allows you to build a momentum before you start probably opening up a location. What's interesting is you guys are still considering that as a as an option. And so the, the ghost kitchen just kind of, kind of gives you like a way to test, right? Do you kind of look at it like that? Like you can test new recipes, test new products and see what works, or I'm sure you guys are already collecting data on people lo- love the Lomo, let's say, or like don't like this so much, right? It's 80, I would say, what, 80% yeah. of the sales is a lomo saltado. <laughs> is that the dish? Is that your, is that like every, every Peruvian place that I've ever been to kills one dish. It's like the, it, they make one thing better than anything else ever. And would you say that's the lomo for you guys? Yeah. I mean, if you yeah. have to do one dish good in a Peruvian, in a Peruvian restaurant, it has to be the lomo. Because that's every order that we get. There is always a lomo. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's only, we were thinking, we're joking, you know, sometimes we were thinking, we should change the name, we should... Call it House of Lomo. House of Lomo, because <laughs> every day is lomo, no, lomo, 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 yeah. lomo, 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 you know? That's not a bad idea. I mean, that's do you feel like you guys are handcuffed in a way to that dish? Do you ever really push other dishes out to your customers to be like, hey, we're not just the house of Lomo. We're also the <laughs> whatever it else might be. Yeah. But, you know, I think it's in, in a good way, it's, it's really interesting because they got the Lomo, they like the Lomo, and then they feel confidence to try the different stuff. Mm. So sure. sometimes, you know, people ask, um, what do you recommend? Oh, how about a rochaufa? Would you like a pasta? Would you like something light? So you can recommend, but the Lomo is the... The, the go-to dish. The go-to that yeah. everybody knows. Yeah, you fall in love with the lomo. That's the one that you fall in love with. We but we do have uh, we created some uh, dishes that are not like traditional Peruvian because we wanted to give it like a like a new touch, like the Peruvian street corn. We have a rotisserie sandwich, so it's we use the pollo, the chicken, the rotisserie chicken, and then we we put it in a sandwich, right? So this is also dishes that we created to make it. I don't know. A new touch. A new touch. And, and we use authentic, you know, we bring the, the, the chocolates or the Peruvian corn from Peru. We use the spices from Peru. Uh, we use the pasta from Peru. 
sometimes, you know, the, the way that we try to present is like a, this is a, the inspiration from our grandmothers. My grandma is from the Andes, from Peru. Her grandma is, you know, Parisian, you know. From Normandy. From Normandy, from, from Normandy. Normandy. But we try to put, it's like, okay, let's see if you are, you're eating, but it's like my grandma and her grandma is cooking for you. Yeah. Doesn't have the fanciness of like a Michelin star, but have the freshness, has the authenticity. The quality and the taste. And we try to do it the most authentic that we can. So people, they will think, people who went to Peru, it's like, oh my God, it tastes like Peru. You know, I remember I was in the coast of Peru and... You know, this is how the ceviche tastes. Even sometimes the fish we bring it from Peru. We try to put the, the, all the experience. And if you never went to Peru, it's like a, you are traveling, traveling. You're traveling, you know, from Los Angeles to Peru without paying ticket, without anything. You know, just getting the all experience in one place. And it's a family recipe. I love that. I love that a lot. Oh, Aymara. Aymara is a, is a Peruvian word. It's a, it used to be a language, kind of like Quechua in Peru. Does the word mean anything specific to you? Is that where your family is from? Or what's, what's kind of the background just behind the name? So Aymara is different meanings. Aymara is a, a language. It's a, it's, a, it's a culture. It's a culture. But we like Aymara because Aymara has a meaning of the name. The meaning of the name of Aymara means beautiful it's, young woman, really creative, it's, but it's, it's a, shy. It's a female inspiration. Because the, the um, Aymara is really, Aymara Peruvian Kitchen is, is for us a tribute to both her grandmother, maternal grandmother, because it's, it's really, as a, it's all the recipe that we have and all the Peruvian food that we have comes from Ralph's family. So it's, you know, his grandma that shared all the recipe with us and we, we, we practice with her. And then it's also my, the love, my love of cooking. I've always wanted to have my restaurant and cook my, my own food. It comes also from my grandmother from Normandy. And so it really is a tribute to them. And so that's why we chose Aymara. That's beautiful. I love it. Obviously, being in L.A. helps, right? There's a lot of Latinos here. There's a lot of Latin culture here. But at the end of the day, you guys chose Lincoln Heights. And I know there's cloud kitchens everywhere. And so... How did you guys go about that? Obviously, Lincoln Heights is also very Latino, but how did you guys choose Lincoln Heights and were you looking at other options and it just made the most sense? I think we, we really love, we love Lincoln Heights. Uh, we've been living in this, in downtown for many, many, mm-hmm. many years. We're downtowners. So Lincoln Heights is really close. So we were familiar with this area and we love it. And also one of the reasons we chose Lincoln Heights is when you do delivery, you kind of want to be in the center and then go five miles radius, right? So choosing yeah. Lincoln yeah. Heights allow us to be able to deliver downtown, Echo Park, Glendale. Eagle, Glendale, Eagle Rock. So we can really touch a good part of the city. And the team here is also, everybody's so kind, so nice. Yeah. Sometimes it's that's very, a feel of Los Angeles. <laughs> it's very inspiring because we, we, our neighbors are all this different, you know, food concept. And there is like, we're all like entrepreneurs here. Mm-hmm. So it's very inspiring. It feels like in some way you guys are kind of at the ground floor of this new world, right? It's like cloud kitchens are a new thing. Everyone's moving the marketing online. COVID hits. It makes perfect sense for you to be in that industry. And it's interesting to see how what's going to happen later. But I do love the fact that you guys still want to bring the culture aspect of Peruvian cuisine, which you kind of need a restaurant for. And so there's still that gap. But nonetheless, for now, you, you guys have found some success and it sounds like things are going really well. So your recommendations for all entrepreneurs out there are 100 percent. Cloud Kitchens make a lot of sense. Did you sign a long term lease? Is it like a two year lease, five year lease? How does that work? Uh, it was, it's a one year, one year lease. Okay. Yeah, but I think you can do months to months. Uh, you can. You, it's very flexible. It, it really is, and that's also a good point. You you mentioned that because usually when when you do a commercial lease, yeah. a real restaurant, it's your your tie for three years usually mm-hmm. minimum. Sometimes even more. Yeah, the, it's super high investment. One of the things we're doing, you mentioned this before, where you were saying like food trucks, like Cloud Kitchen is the new food truck. We're doing this project here in West Hollywood where we're putting a coffee truck inside of a building. And so it used to be running around all LA and then COVID hit. So that got shut down. And who knows when crowds are going to be a thing again. 
And so we just said, well, this coffee truck is actually really, it's a really beautiful 1950s vehicle. And so we said, it's also, it's, it's a Citroën. It's a French Citroën, Citroën. It's a French uh, old vehicle. And so we're putting it inside the building. And I think as we're doing it, I'm like, you know, this will be great because there's so many entrepreneurs that have spent a lot of money building these food trucks out. And it would be cool if you just put them in a building because it's still cool, right? It's still branded. And uh, that way, no one has to like lose their investment in in the concept that they already have. And so whether they're making pizza or whatever it is, and since the since it's a big box, it's already approved by the health department. And so there, it's kind of cool in that way where everything makes sense and the costs are already spent. Now I'm all about finding innovative way of serving food. I mean, 2020, you know, forced us to sing that way, but now actually it's fun. It's, yeah. it's actually a good thing, you know, to, to find new ways of serving food. But in Riverside County, you can actually set up a food operation in your home, in your house, and serve people yeah. there. So things like that, I think we're going to see it more and more happening. Obviously, the whole patio and outdoor dining is, is going to only get bigger. And for our background, Ralph and I, is really like the fine dining restaurant. And I, I don't know, hopefully we'll go back to that one day, but yeah. who knows? One of the final questions I have is if uh, I haven't eaten in four days, what am I ordering from you guys, right? So I'm super hungry. What are you going to bring out to me? What are the four, five, one, two things that I must have on the Aymara menu? Lomo saltado. Lomo saltado <laughs> with beef, ceviche, for sure, the ceviche classico, the arroz chaufa, which is the fried rice. Uh, with shrimp, that's like the, that's amazing. The rotisserie chicken sandwich is one of my favorites. And of course, have to pair it with Inca Cola. Inca Cola. Or Cola Inglesa. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I wanted to circle back around to is something you said, Ralph, where neither you nor Caroline were professional chefs prior to opening up this ghost kitchen. And I used to work on Hell's Kitchen, and one of the things that Gordon Ramsay talked about was the distinction between a cook and a chef you know the difference between oh you might be able to cook for like a family gathering or whatever but to be a professional chef means you have to cook precision accurate every single time every single order that comes in and that's not easy i i don't know from personal experience but i know from close hand watching other people go through that that transition from cook to chef what was that like for you in learning how to become professional chefs after not having done this before? At the beginning, at the beginning for me, actually, I didn't, I never cooked too much in my life, to be honest. So <laughs> how it works is my grandma uh, taught Caroline. Caroline taught me. Well, I always love cooking, but that's like you said, like I've always loved cooking at home for my friends, for my family. That's always been something I've, I've loved. But then, yeah, once you start a real food business, then that's a whole different thing. You have regulation. You have to follow certain rules. Cooking at home is not the same like cooking in a, in a real kitchen. And the consistency is, 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 is key. And also the prep. That, for us, was a whole, di- a whole thing that we, we underestimated the amount of prepping that you have to do in the morning so you're ready for service mm-hmm. the mise en place yeah the mise en place so mm-hmm. this was for us i think the most challenging yeah. we had to rearrange your whole schedule because oh we're fine two hours before we're gonna be fine no 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 you have to be here early in the morning to receive your deliveries to inspect the product and then store it and then prep it and then you know do all your sauces mm-hmm. so uh, and even for for us that we have a, a ghost kitchen that it was it's really small you know it's 125 square feet so every mm-hmm. single uh, item has a, not, has have a, spot. a specific space <laughs> if you move it everything is wrong you know yeah. then you get lost so we changed the the, the way that the the, yeah, we changed the it layout. three times. The layout, we changed it three times until we find the perfect the perfect one for like total efficiency. But now we're good. Yeah. Now, now it's all good. <laughs> so you'd say that all the growing pains are over with and you guys have kind of hit your stride? Yeah. yeah. And yeah, in the first months, we had to scale back on the menu. So in, we, I think after a week, we were like, okay, we have to take out of the menu maybe like four or five dishes 
so we can really concentrate of making less dishes, but we'll make sure we make it good. And then slowly we'll reintegrate the new dishes. So with that train of thought, are there any new dishes on the horizon that you are thinking of adding? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Pescadolo macho. That one is a big nice. one. And we've been working on the recipe for a long time now. It, it's actually overdue. We have to put it at the next one, Pescadolo macho. And then tallarín verde con milanesa. So that's the pesto. Kind of, it's, it's not completely pesto, but it's kind of like a pesto spaghetti dish with a chicken milanesa. Uh, so these two dishes are, are coming soon, really, really soon. You know, we don't have to hold you to this, but like, give us an idea. Like, how soon can we expect to be ordering this? <laughs> okay, the, the pasta dish with the milanesa, hopefully next week. This week, this coming weekend or next week, the pescado lo macho, I would say in two weeks. All right. By the time this is out, our listeners can try them. Well, listen, thanks guys for coming on the podcast and sharing a little bit about your story. Just tell everyone where they can find you guys, where they can support you guys, and uh, where they can order. Yeah, uh, thank you for having us, guys. So we're uh, Aymara Peruvian Kitchen. We are located on 242 North Avenue 25 in Lincoln Heights, Los Angeles. And uh, you can find us on our website, aymaraperuvianKitchen.com. Uh, you can order there. You can also order directly from Instagram. Yeah, just give us a call if you have any question. We're here every day. So if you order with us, you're going to see us giving you the food, right? <laughs> right to your car <laughs> i love it thank you guys for coming on the podcast appreciate it yeah thank you this was a pleasure thank, thank you, you guys